You know, whenever we study animals, or whenever we, we build robots, whenever we search for intelligence in outer space, what we're ultimately doing, we're dealing with the brain. We're dealing with thought. We're dealing with consciousness. Every thought you ever had took place within the walls of your head. I mean, even if you believe that the thoughts exist somewhere else, at least the way that they show up is in electrical impulses in your brain. If we can know more about that, then we can know more about what it means to be human. And our next guest has devoted his life to that question. Um, please welcome uh, Professor Andre Fenton. Andre. So good evening. It turns out that I have a cool job. In fact, <clears throat> I have to thank you and the organizers for inviting me here because oh, I'd well, never okay. thought that I had a cool job. And struggling with uh, trying to come up with what to explain about my um, cool job, I asked myself and my family and, and friends what was cool about my job. And I got a very, very long list of cool things about my job. And I decided to tell you about three of them. Okay? Three cool things about my job. The, the first thing I'm going to tell you about my job is that I get every day to work on something that I have always been interested in forever, as far as I remember. And that thing is me. <laughs> okay. 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 So every day I get to work and I get to recruit other people to work on working out what it is that helps me become me, what makes me me, and that is understanding how my brain works. Okay. I'm going to show you in a moment <clears throat> an example of one of the things that fascinated me early on, there are varieties of illusions that you can um, observe. Here's one of them. I'm going to ask you okay, whether A is darker than B. Okay? Does A look darker than B? Okay. <laughs> well, they sure, A sure looks darker than B to me. It does work out, however, that they are indeed the same. We can demonstrate that by drawing some uh, bars that are the same color as A and B. And the reason that A looks darker than B is an illusion that comes from an understanding of how the eye and the brain processes the information that you see. Okay? And I won't go into the details of that, but what is very clear to me when I saw illusions like this early in my life was that it was not certain okay, what was real. Okay, and that what was real had a lot to do with my brain. So I always became fascinated with the notion of subjective reality. That my brain, in some way, is interpreting the world okay, and making sense of the world in a way that's perhaps unique to me, or at least unique to my species. I'll give you an example of the kinds of things that I, I study in a moment. <clears throat> so one of the jobs of a scientist, in fact, the main job of any scientist, whether you're a neuroscientist as I am, okay, or a physicist or a biologist, the main job of a scientist is to find solvable problems to work on. Okay? So, I'm interested in understanding my brain. I'm interested in understanding a particular set of features about my brain, that being how I think. Okay? And that's a very complicated question to, to uh, even pose. In fact, let me tell you a little bit about the brain. Okay? There are about 100 billion neurons in the typical human brain. That's a very, very large number of neurons. Neurons are the individual cells that make up a brain. Okay. Those neurons, each one of them, on average, makes about 10,000 connections 
to other neurons. So we have trillions of connections in the brain between neurons. And one of the fundamental things that neurons do is communicate with each other across these connections. These connections are called synapses. And we've been able to work out how the brain stores information in memory by changing the connections between those neurons. And that's one of the areas of research that I've particularly fond of and have had some success. We've identified a single molecule and how that single molecule operates to store the information that you're going to collect from this experience, from every experience that you've had. And if you're going to keep that information, if you're going to store those memories for your lifetime, you're activating this molecule PKM zeta. The way this molecule works has taught us that it's possible to erase memories. It's possible to enhance memories. And it hopefully will teach us how we might interfere with pathological memories, as in traumatic, uh, um, traumatic memory disorders of, uh, and the like. Okay. But I have a different question that my laboratory also works on, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. I've always been fascinated okay, by the fact that my brain changes, and I learn from experience. Okay. And what I learn will inform how I will subsequently experience the world. Okay? That's the neat thing about brains. They're plastic. As you experience the world, as you listen to, to the various talks today, your brain is changing. And it's changing for good. And you are now a different person. And you will experience the world differently as a result of that. So that was the thing that our laboratory would like to understand. How is it that our brains interpret the world in the multiple ways that we can interpret the world and in the ways that are determined through experience? So I'll give you an example of that. I'm going to ask you to do what is known as the Stroop test. Okay? I'm going to ask you to I'm going to show you a bunch of uh, words, and I'm going to ask you to say the color and ignore the, the meaning of the word. So here, the right answer would be black. Okay. okay. And I'm going to ask everybody to call out okay, the color of the words that I'm going to show you. <clears throat> okay. Are we all ready? Okay. The monitor will say, ready, go, and about every one second, you'll get a new stimulus. Okay. This is a psychological test, and it will tell me enormous amounts about my audience. Okay? Are you ready? Okay. It will say, ready, go, and then begin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> These guys okay. are good. These guys are good. So, did anyone recognize the Turkish words? Okay. <laughs> so, those of you who don't know Turkish didn't have difficulty calling out the colors of those Turkish words that were color incongruent. Okay? Color incongruent is the type of word that you had difficulty with. So when red was written in the color blue, you had difficulty to call out blue because your brain had two interpretations of that, and it had to choose one or the other. It had to choose one or the other. Okay. And so that very simple problem that we just demonstrated should have given you a sense that there is a difficulty in making sense of the world when you have to make choices between your interpretations of the world. And those choices are sometimes dictated by your experience. Those of you who have not experienced Turkish, 
didn't have as much difficulty as those of you who have experienced and learned English. So we wanted to study this in the rat. Okay? And what we did, I'm going to skip through this quickly, what we did was we created a situation where a rat was on a carousel, very much like the carousel you could go to in an amusement park. And when the carousel turns, the rat can understand where it is, color-coded red here, in the room, like in the amusement park, okay, whether it's in the north or the south or near the fountain or, or far from the fountain. It could also understand where it was on the rotating arena relative to the smells on the arena that the rat cares about. So very uh, analogous to you being on a carousel, knowing where you are relative to the red horse or the black horse, that kind of thing. And what we are able to do is record the activity of the rat's brain, the electrical activity of the rat's brain, because that's one of the neat things about a brain. It's very much like a heart. Okay? The brain makes these signals and communicates by sending electrical pulses across those synapses amongst the 100 billion or so neurons in the brain. And if we were able to record 20 or 30 of these neurons, and by putting those, that information into our computer and teaching the computer how to decode the activity of this rat's brain, we could, in essence, mind read the rat, and we could see that the rat was sometimes thinking about where it was in the room and sometimes thinking about where it was on the rotating surface. And we could do that. Um, uh, reliably in a variety of situations. I would love to demonstrate that to you here, but there are difficulties with bringing rats in and recording their electrical activity up on stage. But I am going to show you in a few minutes a recording from a colleague of mine. Now let me show you what we, what we got the rat to do. Okay. While it's on this carousel, this is sped up a little bit. The rat is running around these Areas are color-coded for us to see, but this rat has learned to not go into the red area because its feet will hurt. There'll be a mild shock. It's also learned not to go into this blue area. Its feet will also hurt because there's a mild shock there. And it learns to navigate both of these spatial frames. And we were able to decode what the rat was thinking about moment to moment as we did this. So this is a rudimentary form of mind reading, if you will. I'm going to try and show you a more uh, a live version of, of mind reading. I'm going to invite a couple of colleagues of mine to come out, if you will, please. Okay. This is Dr. Ahmet Amortag, who works with me. And he's going to provide a brain. Okay. <laughs> and, and Dr. Sama here um, is going to uh, act as a physician. He's, in fact, a physician. And I'm going to. Well, I'll describe what he's doing. What, I, what it had occurred to us as we we're recording the activity in the brain is that the, the electronics that we had built so that we could put on a rat, okay, those electronics are not even available for recording from human brains. And uh, another, the third aspect of my job that I absolutely love is I get to think about ways to change the world. So a sad story inspired me to start to record from human brains in emergency departments, in emergency situations. A friend of mine was knocked down by a FedEx truck. She hurt her head. She was in the hospital. And she was unable to receive an EEG. She was unable to have her brain examined. Okay? And it took weeks in order to do that due to various logistics and the fact that it's very difficult to record the brain act, brain's electrical activity in, except in very specialized circumstances. What Sama is doing here looks really gnarly, but all he's doing is he's putting some jelly, okay, salt water and jelly in essence, into this cap so that they can make a connection between the scalp and the white electrode so that we can pick up those electrical signals. And what it occurred to me is that, look, in our laboratory, we're capable of recording the electrical activity from rats as they run around and hit their heads on walls and jump and, and do various things. And it should be possible to do this very same thing in the emergency department for people who need this kind of care. 
Uh, I'll give you an anecdote. If you remember, two winters ago, Natasha Richardson, the uh, late actress, had fallen and hit her head while skiing. She subsequently died. She had visited two emergency departments and never had this procedure. Had she had this procedure, it's very likely the doctors would have recognized that her brain had suffered an injury and been able to treat her. So one of the very nice things about my job is that I get to do things like this, develop a technology, taking it from the laboratory into the clinic where we're able to look at the brain's activity. And what I'm going to try and show you is a, a little bit of mind reading, again, if, if we will. You can let me know when we can activate this. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to, can we see the, uh, the monitor, please? Okay, here, if, if, some of you'll, uh, there we go, reduce the gain. This is the electrical activity coming from, from Mamet's brain. Um, it starts on this side and it's going to the other way. I'm going to ask Ahmet to close his eyes, okay, just to relax. There's a lot of noise here. If you'll open your eyes and maybe we'll, we'll ask you to shift your eyes left and right. Sama. If you'll, if you'll uh, cause him to make lateral eye movements, don't touch him, please. This is not looking all that. There we go. So as he moves his eyes left and right, you can see these deflections here. Okay, they're very noisy, but they're there. Okay. This is the. Ahmet has a has. If he'll close his eyes and relax, we'll be able to see a particular signal. But I'm not sure he can relax enough for us. Okay. No one's watching, Ahmet. No laughing. Can you adjust the gain some more? Okay. He's looking for something called a gamma rhythm, an alpha rhythm, excuse me. Okay. Can you open your eyes? I'm not seeing it. This is, in fact, his heartbeat that we're picking up on his scalp. Okay. Okay. But, but Sama is not going to relax for us. So, um, In any case, this is the kind of thing that we are able to do um, in circumstances so that we can interpret a person's uh, a functional brain state and, if necessary, uh, intervene. Can I go to the next slide, please? If you submit those data to our computer, what you're able to do is to find very often clear signals uh, from the raw data like this that are telling us that the brain is in a functionally bad state. What this, look, this is what schizophrenia looks like when the EEG is interpreted uh, appropriately. I'm going to go to the last slide. Okay. And the last thing that I love about my job is that I get to work with a lot of very different people. This person's a biomedical engineer. This person's a biomedical engineer. This person's a biologist. This person's a biochemist. This person's an electrophysiologist. This person's a medical student. This person is a behavioral scientist. And this what, person's... What's, what's with all the dogs? <laughs> ah, and I get to take my dog to the lab. <laughs> 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 um, Professor Andre Fenton, everybody, <laughs> thank you so much.